Welcome. I'm very glad to be here with Gary Lockman, an old friend and colleague. And I feel that we've uh, in many ways been on parallel tracks with our careers, which is unfortunate in some ways in that they haven't crossed as much as I might have liked, but I guess that's just the way it is. Well, Gary, I'm very pleased to chat with you. And you've written so many books on so many different subjects that it would be difficult to pin you down to one to start with. But I'm going to start with one that is probably the most topical given current events. You wrote a book called The Rise of Holy Russia, which talks about currents in Russian thought, occult and otherwise, as they're taking place in Russia today. Obviously, with the invasion of Ukraine, uh, this is a, an area of vital interest. So could you tell us a bit about what you think is going on in the light of the broader context of the ideas you've explored? Well, yeah, the book uh, Return of Holy Russia, I mean, that, that came out with two sort of sources for that. One was that the previous book I did, it's called Dark Star Rising, Magic and Power in the Age of Trump, which is about all the strange occult politics or seeming occult politics surrounding Trump's campaign and his uh, administration. And in the course of doing that book, I had a, ch a chapter dealing with Russia, mostly focused on this individual, Alexander Dugan, who's, who's been in the news. Sadly, he's been in the news lately because his daughter was, you know, just horribly, you know, assassinated. And, um, you know, very sorry to hear that. I, I'm no fan of Dugan's work, but no one should be subjected to that, to that sort of violence. And I had a lot of material left over from that book uh, about Russia. And at the same time, I saw a, uh, I think it was an article in the New York Times about a speech that Vladimir Putin had given to Russia United, which is the, you know, the main political party uh, in Russia, in which he had a reading list, and he was giving it to his regional governors. And Putin comes across, or he tries to come across as being bookish, you know, he name drops Dostoevsky and, and others, and, you know, rightly so, from, from Russian um, literature, much more than any president that I know has ever name checked any great American writer or anything like that. And I, I was curious because some of the people that were on this reading list he was giving his regional governors, I had read myself. One was uh, Nicholas Berdyaev, who was a um, strange blend of uh, Christian uh, ex-Marxist and existentialist who, who um, wrote books from the 20s into the 40s. And I, I, I had read quite a few of his books. And then um, Vladimir Soloviev who's generally considered to be sort of the first, you know, real philosopher that, that, that uh, Russia produced. And he was sort of, he had sort of mystical, visionary uh, view of things. And I was just curious to see that Putin was, you know, asking his, you know, regional governors to read these sorts of books. And the response from the, sort of the American critics uh, was, you know, oh, this is, you know, Putin's attempt to sort of warm up these notions of what well, today we call Russian exceptionalism or United States exceptionalism. It's this notion that there's some some destiny, some some you know historical destiny uh, for the given nation, whether it's America manifest destiny in the 19th century or now, or in 19th century Russia was considered holy Russia. I mean, with a little help from the Russian winter, Alexander the first had had defeated Napoleon. And he was uh, the main figure in the Holy Alliance. And there was this whole notion that um, uh, Russia was the last bastion of the true Christian faith and all that sort of thing. And I had written about this particular period in Russian history called the Silver Age, more or less, I guess, you know, the, the, the fin de siècle up until about the, well, the Bolshevik uh, revolution put paid to it um, in an earlier book called A Dark Muse, which was about the influence of um, occult ideas on, on literature. Uh, so I was just curious to see that he was, you know, referring to this, you know, um, gesturing towards it. And it was understandable because um, 
uh, if nothing else, Russia has been going through an identity crisis uh, ever since the collapse of um, the USSR. And, you know, we, we recently, with Gorbachev's uh, death and the kind of muted, fairly muted response to that, um, you know, Putin didn't didn't attend the funeral and so on and so on. So, and and he's he's he said you know famously that the collapse of the Soviet Union was the the, the greatest catastrophe of the 20th century and so on and, and so on. So um, it it just struck me as very interesting that you know he was referring to these philosophers and to this particular time um, um, in in an attempt to give modern or contemporary postmodern Russia and uh, a, a renewed sense of identity. And this all blended in with some of the things I talked about in Dark Star Rising. Um, this notion that uh, uh, what's happening in Russia now is not, uh, well, there's a new civilization emerging from uh, Eurasia, which is the, you know, the largest landmass on the planet, the mother of all continents. And um, again, the notion that the West was going down, the West was going under, and uh, this this new, completely different sort of civilization was arising um, out of that that part of the world with its own you know view of uh, view of things, its own kind of politics, its own kind of social ideas, and and so on. And this was a a, a, a notion that was promoted uh, very vigorously by uh, Alexander Dugan in a variety of different books. So um, I I just it just struck me that. Um, what was happening was that, you know, these sort of religious or spiritual or mystical ideas were, were informing, um, you know, what was happening uh, in global, uh, uh, you know, uh, politics in the world. And this struck me as something that, uh, as I said, carried over from Dark Star Rising. One of the things in that book that I tried to get across was all these sorts of ideas that you and I have been interested in for years that have always been on the margin, on the fringe. They seem to have come into the in full center. They seem to have come in, in into the center of things. I mean, the New York Times is talking about you know mystical philosophies informing geopolitics. Then you know uh, one you know uh, raises an eyebrow, wonders, oh, what's going on there? So that that was sort of the the main idea behind it when I when I approached my publishers with the idea of doing it. I personally think Russia has a magnificent future. It's always had a magnificent future, and it always will have a magnificent future. Beyond that, I have questions about this new world civilization because what Russia has done since the Bolshevik revolution has basically killed off or driven away their smartest, best creative people. I mean, it's almost been a deliberate policy. And even since the beginning of this year, a lot of the Russian intelligentsia have simply gotten out of there as I would. So I guess I have some, I mean, this is obviously, you're right. This is their idea of what they're creating, but it's, it's rather, uh, <laughs> uh, it seems to be rather self-defeating in practice. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. I mean, I, I'm, 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 I didn't write the book to promote, you know, what, what was being done. And um, one reason I wrote the book is to say that whatever tactical or, or strategic reasons Putin is doing this. And of course, he's a politician and he's been in power for a long time. And I, I suspect now one of the main things on his mind is how, how much longer can I stay in power and who's going to take care of me once I'm, I'm not, sort of like a mafioso boss. Uh, in many ways, you can see that too, all his gestures towards, you know, the church and all of that and going to Mount Athos and, and you know, uh, being on hand for the, the refurbishment of monasteries and cathedrals and so on and so on. It's sort of like a mafioso boss who goes to church on Sundays and gives lots of money uh, to that kind of thing. No, I mean, um, uh, this was something that's come up in other interviews I've done and, and talks uh, I, I've given that are up on YouTube where people are either, they're either like saying, oh, how could you possibly be supporting Putin's, you know, inexcusable actions? Or they're, they're complaining that I'm, I'm supporting the, the Ukrainian Nazis. So it's like, no, I'm not doing either. I'm just saying it's fascinating to me that these ideas seem to be around and whatever use Putin or anybody else is making of them, we should be aware of them. And I also think that philosophers like Berdyaev and Soloviev that he's pointing to should be read on their own merits. They shouldn't be just, um, you know, uh, dismissed because he's making use of them. I'm, I'm less keen on um, uh, uh, someone I hadn't read, uh, Ivan Ilyin, who was another uh, character from this this time, the Silver Age. And it's funny you you you, you mention you talk about how it's self-defeating because the intelligentsia are leaving. Well, in 1922. 
um, 100 years ago, actually, I think pretty soon, uh, if uh, I think it was in October, um, Lenin uh, put all of the intelligentsia that he didn't want to be in, around anymore, but who, who he couldn't just eradicate outright, uh, on on these on on these ships, they were and they were called the philosophy steamers, and they were sent out. And Berdyaev is one of the ones who wound up, you know, uh, first in Germany and then and then in Paris. And there was many 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 others on there, and some who weren't on the ships, you know, wound up being wound up being eradicated or put into you know prison or the gulag and that sort of thing. So yes, there is there is this. Uh, I don't know what what do you want to say? There is this strange kind of uh, double think um, where. Uh, Putin seems to be presenting, or Dugan is doing this as well, um, Russia as a spiritual alternative to the increasingly materialistic, uh, you know, self-serving, me-oriented um, uh, West, when at the same time we know that, you know, uh, you know it's, it's the country of oligarchs and gangster politics and, and all that sort of thing. But this is, this is the, it just struck me as he's making those gestures. He's trying to, you know, this is what we're about and all that kind of thing. So the new Cold War, which is heating up now, <laughs> there's a lot of jokes in there. As the winter comes down and the gas gets turned off, the Cold War is heating up, but it's going to get colder, actually, for most of us. Um, uh, is uh, it's not about communism or ver uh, versus capitalism. It's about the um, increasingly decadent West, where you know everything is negotiable, everything is purchasable, and you know Eurasia is the mother of all continents, which is you know the bastion of tradition and all this sort of thing. So, I mean that that that's the scenario they're presenting. I mean, how much Putin actually buys into that is you know is is, is another question. Yeah. Well, of course, I wasn't suggesting that you were supporting these ideas. I'm curious about one of Dugan's principal ideas, which you've already alluded to, which is Eurasia and particularly Russia as kind of the pivot point of the world, which he seems to believe entitles it to control the world. Now, this is a curious idea. It actually goes back to an Englishman named Mackinder in the early 20th centuries and a Nazi theorist named Haushofer, uh, who said the same thing. Um, it's never proved to be correct. That's never been uh, a pivot point. And Russia, so far from being at the center, being able to influence everything, seems exposed from all sides. So what do you think of that idea in light of all these uh, <laughs> truths? Mm. Well, I mean, you know, I mean, the, the ideas themselves are fascinating. Um, and then there's the use they're made of them and whether they actually fit. You know, uh, there's a phrase here they use. It's like something's fit fit for purpose. You know, if uh, if you know something, you know, some either some doctrine or whatever it is, some you know, oh, this is really suit what it's supposed to do. So, uh, I mean, the idea that you're alluding to is is um, this notion that goes, yes, it goes back to this Edwardian historian or ge geographer, Halford Mackinder, uh, who gave a, a speech on it, I think, to the Royal Geographic Society, I think, 1904, around there. Where at the time, a lot of British political theorists were thinking Germany was the their real problem they had to look out for, and uh, but he was saying no, 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 it's Russia, and he had this idea that there was one battle, there was one war throughout history, uh, you know, different participants, diff you know, taking place at different times in different ways, but it was this battle between uh, what he called the Atlanticists or the maritime mercantile uh, countries. Oh, and uh, again, this 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 land-based, you know, I don't know if he used the term traditional, but it was this land-based um, sensibility that, uh, again, Eurasia is this, the mother of all continents. It's the biggest single landmass on the planet. And this is something that um, uh, Dugan has picked up on. And it's and now it's like, you know, OK, the Atlantis is it's the United States, it's Britain, it's uh, NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. So from his perspective, it's uh, the West, the Atlantis want to turn the entire globe into a big, you know, um, shopping mall, a big marketplace where everything is negotiable. I mean, reality. I mean, you know, uh, you know, uh, he points out things like, you know, the one of the big concerns or the, you know, the big uh, talking points uh, in the West now is about gender and all this sort of thing. And you, you, you could be whatever you want to be and all that sort of thing. And uh, and it's this it's what I call the me economy. 
uh, and I'm, I'm again, I'm, I'm, I'm characterizing it in the sense that everything is focused on me, me, me. It's what I want. I, I should be able to have whatever I want. And reality is malleable. And it, again, that relates to a variety of other contexts. This is, you know, Trump's whole uh, notion of uh, power of positive thinking and, and the new thought and chaos magic sort of stuff that the Trump supporters, the alt right, about whom we never hear anything anymore. They, they were they were very very newsworthy a few years ago, but now you know nobody talks about them at all. Uh, and also, strangely enough, the the whole sort of deconstructionist and postmodern background to this in academia which is it's more or less on the left but it, it in many ways it it fed this idea that reality is malleable and trump you know basically i'm sure he doesn't know anything about postmodernism deconstruction or any of this sort of stuff but the idea is reality is whatever i want to make it fine i can go with that and this similarly over in russia so um but um i i i, I think one of the as we say one of the problems or one of the uh dangers here is that people who are understandably disenchanted with capitalism and you know the materialist society uh you know the black friday society that that it's created um can feel a sympathy for someone like dugan's um critiques of the west uh which he, he voices very very you know um, furiously in his books and and uh, if you've ever you know listen to any of the talks he's, he has on, on, on YouTube and all that sort of thing. Um, and this, I think, creates a situation in which you have this kind of penumbra of, um, what do you want to call it? It's, I'm mixing my metaphors, but it's sort of like, it's not the mainstream, it's just this outer world where, you know, people that wouldn't necessarily meet, they meet there. So it's when I say it's like the, the far right meets the far out in, you know, uh, in the QAnon and all that kind of thing. And, um, it, it adds to this strange atmosphere we live in these days, this kind of epistemological uncertainty where, you know, it's every, we live in a time, I like to say, where everything is plausible, but nothing is definite. And it's, it's really difficult to sort of argue against anything in this time, because the whole notion of truth and reality and all of that has become so, so eroded and evaporated that you, you, you find yourself, you really don't have, you know, much of a position to stand on. So, uh, I mean, I, I don't think Halford McKinder, you know, would I don't know much about him, but I don't think he would necessarily be happy to know that his idea has been resurrected in this form. Um, but it, it, um, it, it, how should we say, it, it's, it does seem to fit the situation. It does, you know, whatever you think about, you know, Russia, the reality of it being the bastion of tradition, it does seem that the West has, you know, increasingly become much more, um, how should we say, you know, com completely identified or characterized by, by this, this sort of materialism and, and, and the notion that, you know, everything is up for grabs, everything's negotiable. Well, this is fascinating, uh, and we could talk more on it, but I'd like to go on to a completely different and um, I hope more agreeable topic. Uh, you are a member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame as part of a founding member of Blondie, and obviously you know a great deal about the rock scene. And one thing that's always fascinated me about it is how occult ideas, thoughts, symbols have permeated into the world of rock. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how that actually happens, how it's actually done. Um, well, I think, um, I think it started in the 1960s. Uh, the first book, uh, my first book is called Turn Off Your Mind, um, the mystic 60s and the dark side of the age of Aquarius. And um, in it, I, well, the basic theme of the book is that so much of the pop pop culture in the 1960s was was informed with occult, mystical, you know, esoteric sorts of ideas, and it was very new then. Uh, again, it was it was a, a time when this sort of stuff was on the fringe, much more on the fringe. I mean, today today we're you know we're sort of used to it in the mind body spirit you know milieu and all that sort of thing. But put yourself back then, and um, it was threatening in the same way that you know the psychedelic. Uh, movement was sort of threatening and, and um, sexual experimentation was threatening to, you know, uh, sort of um, mainstream moral notions and all that. And um, I say in the book that um, the thing that got the, what I call the 19th, the, the occult revival of the 1960s going uh, was a book called The Morning and the Magicians that was actually first published in, in Paris in 1960, I believe. 
And it was a surprise bestseller, um, um, uh, Louis Pauls and Jacques Berger were the authors. And um, it, it, I say in the book, it was as if a UFO had landed in front of, um, you know, the Café du Mago in the saint germain de pre and, you know, black and white beret, Galois smoking uh, Paris, the Paris of engagement and, and, and Samuel Beckett and all that. And suddenly everything's technicolor and it's all about UFOs and magic and alchemy and um, all the strange stuff that, you know, nowadays, uh, 60, whatever, somebody, so many years later, you know, there's, there's, there's a whole uh, culture about this. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was very, very new then. And it, it gradually percolated into the, the wider realm of popular culture. It was a big bestseller. It was in, in France and it was a bestseller when it translated into translated into English. And by by the by the sort of mid, you know, 1967, uh, the most famous people in the world, the Beatles, uh, were, were completely interested in this kind of stuff and deep into it. And it'd be, you know, famously um, Alistair Crowley, you know, the dark magician of the 20th century. He's on the cover of Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Lamp, so is Jung. And I have to say, Jung is probably, if one person was responsible single-handedly for ushering in these sorts of ideas, I would say it was Jung, because in his last years, um, uh, he had hitherto kind of kept, played his occult cards very close to his chest. But after a, uh, um, a near-death experience he had um, in, in the last years of World War I, um, when he had a heart attack, um, he opened up more about this and he's writing about ufos he's writing about synchronicity he's writing introductions to dt suzuki suzuki's books about zen and the tibetan book of the dead and the I Ching and, and so on and so on uh he's on the cover of sergeant peppers and so is aldous huxley is you know who um we could say kind of started the popularization of psychedelia and all that and so uh, if you look at the you know just the previous couple of years, I mean, the mods weren't in interested in any of this sort of stuff. And the drugs of choice then were amphetamines. They weren't psychedelics. They weren't mind expanding. They were, you know, you know, very physical kind of, you know, uh, get up and go kind of drugs. And it was a very, very different sort of thing. And um, I mean, the Rolling Stones, they got very much interested in it through um, the filmmaker, Kenneth Anger, who, um, uh, who was a devotee of, of Crowley. And uh, his film, uh, The Inauguration of the Pleasure Dome, which is basically a Crowleyan ritual on, on, on celluloid. And uh, Anais Nin is in it. And also Marjorie Cameron, who was the wife of Jack Parsons, um, who was by day, the, you know, the real rocket scientist, the Jet Propulsion Lab, but by night um, uh, was, was a Crowley devotee. And basically he, he was the head of an OTO which is one of Crowley's magical organizations, the Ordo Templi Orientis in Pasadena. And he was keeping Crowley alive in you know, his last years in the late 40s from contributions coming from there. So it, it, um, I, I, I actually gave a talk about this recently and it, it sort of peaked in 69. Um, you have Edgar Cayce years before saying 1969 Atlantis was going to rise. Well, physically it didn't, but the, the singer Donovan had a, had a number one hit with the song Atlantis. And and uh, John Michel, um, who kind of inaugurated the whole ley line phenomena, his his book The View Over Atlantis came out came out in '69 as well. So in that sense, Atlantis did rise. Uh, you have the Fifth Dimension, the name of the band itself, you know, is, is an occult uh, uh, gesture, uh, having a hit with the, the dawning of the Age of Aquarius, which Jung was talking about as early as the '40s and all that. And it it. Uh, Sadly, you know, what happens with the 60s themselves, it, you, you have in, in all in a very short time, you have Woodstock happening. Um, the week before Woodstock, you had the Manson murders, but it didn't turn out that Charles Manson and the family were responsible for them until later on. Uh, but then at the end of 69, you have the, the, um, the tragic um, catastrophic concert by the Rolling Stones at uh, the uh, Altamont Speedway in, 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 um, in San Francisco. Um, where the Hell's Angels wind up, wound up, you know, beating someone to death and all that. So there was this expectation, you know, of something miraculous and, and you know, mere, magical going to happen at some point. And then it all kind of, you know, uh, went south, as, as we say these days. But I, I think after that, you have the domestication of the, the magical sort of stuff, which had been threatening, but that, that you have the beginning of the new age, you know, you have the beginning of the mind, body, spirit, you know, 
culture that we we all we all know and you know we're part of ourselves and um but in music you have what i call the genre of rock cult and roll you know with the heavy metal bands like black sabbath and all that doing it and out of all those figures who were popular from the, the occult period jung and man blavatsky as well and others crowley is the one who who's kind of stayed he's, he's kind of stayed as a kind of um rock and roll icon at least in sort of the heavy metal uh kind of world and mostly because of his you know prolific interest in drugs and and polymorphously perverse sexuality and all that sort of thing that kind of let it all you know uh be big live big live large kind of sensibility that 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 he that he promoted well let's go on to another main theme in many of your writings uh which is the work of gurdjieff and uspensky You've uh, written a biography of Uspensky, Strange Life of P.D. Uspensky, and obviously they've had some influence in your own thought and ideas. And I'm wondering if you could say a little bit about what you think is particularly important about them and their contribution. Many, many years ago, I was involved in the work for a few years in New York and, and then in Los Angeles. Um, um, Subsequently decided it wasn't for me, but I did learn quite a bit from it. And I was always fascinated with the relationship between Gurdjieff and Uspensky, because um, somehow I identified with Uspensky just in the sense that I, it, just in the sense of, a, you know, a seeker for wisdom, but I'm, you know, sort of philosophical and, uh, you know, um, I hate to use the word intellectual, but something along those lines. Uh, and I always liked Uspensky because he seemed to combine this kind of romantic search for a deeper meaning with a kind of very, very severe and austere kind of intellect. Um, he, he was, um, he, he, he didn't, he, he didn't make it easy for himself. And so I, I, I admired that, that kind of rigor that, um, and then the, their story uh, that he, you know, he, he, he wrote about in, in Search and Miraculous. Uh, it takes place against this incredibly, you know, uh, historical backdrop of, you have the, the beginning of World War I, then the Russian Revolution, then the Civil War, and you have Gurdjieff, this enigmatic um, esoteric teacher, the man who knows, uh, and Uspensky trying to learn from him, and then his band of followers, uh, the Gurdjieff's band of followers with him, and he, you know, he, he they literally go across the entire continent, you know, from Moscow and St. Petersburg, winding up down in Constantinople in, in refugee camps and things of that sort. So, I mean, that in itself, it's a, it's an incredible spiritual adventure story. And then the teaching, um, you know, uh, sadly, I suspect Gurdjieff is right in many ways. You know, we are not awake, or at least not as awake as we can be. We are more mechanical than we'd like to think we, we are. Um, actually, I'm, I'm giving a talk about them uh, late, later, this, later this month for a group here in London. And I've been working on the PowerPoint of that um, the last few days. And it's, uh, whenever I get into it, I'm always drawn back into the, this, this sort of the whole narrative, the whole drama, the story. And, uh, you know, Spensky splits with Gurdjieff at a certain time. And, and then in his last days, in the last lectures he gave, he rejects the system itself. Um, and he basically tells his uh, students, um, uh, he was he, coming back to London uh, after leaving it during the war, during the Blitz and living in, in, in New York and New Jersey for a while. Um, he comes back uh, to the war. I mean, <laughs> Gurdjieff said, you know, the earth was in a very bad place in the universe. And then when Uspensky went back to London in 1947. That was one of the worst places you could possibly go back to. You know, after the after the Blitz and the war, it was rationing. There was no energy and all that. It was really, really tough time. And um, this is when he announces to his students there that he the, the system. You know, he's he's given up on it completely. Uh, what, what is all that? Was was it just the admission that he made a mistake? Was it, as some believe, a kind of you know uh, shock? which is part of the whole Gurdjieff system, you know, some kind of sudden, you know, disruptive shock to you know, shake you out of your habitual way. Um, and so all that, the drama of all that has always kind of fascinated me. And, um, you know, and it's also the relationship between, I guess, the, the, the guru and the chela, the student and the teacher, what was that about? And, you know, I think Gurdjieff is in the line of um, someone like Blavatsky as well, which, uh, you know, did they con at times? You know, were they, were they you know, I mean, Uspensky was a very, you know, straightforward, I, I think, kind of, um, you know, uh, honest 
um, intellectual. Uh, but Gurdjieff was someone who, you know, would use any any tactic that he thought was necessary in order to achieve his ends and all that. So there's this, there's a side of him which is kind of iffy, you know. And you know, we know what all the stories were: the American Canary, where he's painting the birds and selling them off, you know, and all that sort of stuff. So there is this kind of um, shark aspect to him where he knows what to do. And uh, Blavatsky as well, where you know she she was an irascible. Um, uh, madcap kind of character who, you know, uh, would be explosive uh, to the people around her and, and, and create situations in which they didn't know what to do. So um, the, just this, the, the dynamic between the two has always struck me as, as, as something that had a great deal of um, dramatic power uh, to it. And um, yeah, that's something I, you know, as recently I've been, as I said, I'm giving a talk later this month and I was reintroduced to that again. Well, of course, Gurdjieff's idea, or one of his main ideas, was the sleep of man. Man mm -hmm. born in sleep, in sleep he lives, and in sleep he dies. Now, one figure who is very much influenced by Gurdjieff, particularly in this respect, was also a great influence on you, in Colin, namely Colin Wilson, who actually wrote a book on Gurdjieff called The War Against Sleep. And Colin Wilson has obviously been a major inspiration to you. And perhaps we could go on and you could talk about uh, why he's been such an influence and why you think his work is important. Well, I mean, the, my introduction to all this sort of stuff, uh, Gurdjieff, Blavatsky, um, Uspensky, Crowley, uh, came through reading a book of Wilson's just called The Occult. Uh, originally published in 1971, I, I read it in 1975 when I was um, first playing in Blondie, the then very unknown Blondie, uh, living on the Bowery in New York uh, at a time when the Bowery really was the Bowery. I mean, if you go there, if you throw a rock in any direction, you can't afford the cappuccino. Um, but uh, back then it really was, you know, Skid Row and all that. And um, where we were living in this rundown sort of loft space, uh, we had one floor, but the, the, the fellow who had sort of control of the building and rented us this floor, he was a flamboyant artist who was very interested in, in, in Crowley. And he used to do sort of impromptu readings on Crowley's Thoth tarot deck and all that. And among sort of books that were around at the time was this book um, by Wilson called The Occult. And I had no interest in this sort of stuff before. The only interest I sort of had in the occult was through weird fiction, like H.P. Lovecraft and that kind of thing, or, or, you know, the horror movies from the 40s. But I didn't really take it seriously, but I read a lot. I read Existentialism and Hesse. I mean, I was a big, I was, I was one of the, you know, Herman Hesse casualties of the early 70s in America and all that. And, um, and um, I just found this book, you know, and I borrowed it and started reading it. And it just was so well written and it was gripping. It was a real page turner. And I didn't know at the time that Wilson had a whole history of writing books about existentialism and phenomenology and all this sort of stuff earlier. So I didn't know that when I was first reading it. But he, he approached the occult from a philosophical perspective and a perspective of psychology and history and literature and all that. And I just learned a great deal. And um, I subsequently went on to read all of his books. And another one that uh, had a huge influence on me was his first book was called The Outsider. And interesting enough, uh, in that book, he was one of the first people to talk about Gurdjieff. The book came out in 56. Um, you had, you know, uh, I guess, uh, In Search of Miraculous and Beelzebub's Tale, I think they're published in 49 or 50. You have some accounts by some of the people who were involved in them then, but n not much was written about um, Gurdjieff and Uspensky from people outside. But Wilson had read in search of miraculous and so on. And uh, at the end of The Outsider, he's talking about Gurdjieff. And interestingly enough, he was also talking about Hesse in that book at a time when Hesse wasn't popular. Uh, he doesn't get credit for this, but The Outsider was probably one of the books responsible for the, for the Hesse you know, revival um, in, in the late 60s, early 70s. And um, The Outsider is, um, it's a book about, well, it, Wilson said that I, the idea of The Outsider came to him because he, he wanted to know why so many artists and writers and poets in the late 19th, early 20th century either went mad or committed suicide or died young or, for, you know, uh, for one reason or another. And um, he felt that they all had encountered this kind of loss of meaning in the world and, um, and in different ways tried to, you know, overcome that. And the, the thesis is that back, say, in the Middle Ages, if you had a 
a, a deep hunger for some kind of meaning, you could go to the, you could find a place for yourself in the church. You can become a monk or something like that. Um, but at the time when he was writing, the whole idea of running off to an ashram wasn't as popular anymore. Nowadays, people can say, oh, you can go to an ashram, you can do this or this. But when Wilson was writing this book in the early 50s, that wasn't the case. And so he's saying, that, uh, you know, there, there isn't a place for these sort of, um, I hate to say tortured geniuses, but that's more or less what they were. They can't find any place for themselves in the world. The, the, you know, the modern world doesn't have a place for them. The modern world can't provide the kind of sense of meaning that these people crave. They crave in the same way that, you know, each of us craves food and drink and air. You know, it's something that they absolutely have to have. And um, I identified with that, you know, as many as many others did. And I um, just read more and more of his books. And then in 1983, uh, uh, while I was actually still involved in the work in Los Angeles uh, with a friend of mine, who was involved, and actually his parents had been involved. They they had been with Uspensky in um, when he was in New York and in, in New Jersey at Franklin Farms in in Mendham, in in the world war, in the years you know during World War II. So he had grown up in it. Um, we went on this what I later called the mini search of the miraculous, and uh, which took us to places like Chartres Cathedral and Glastonbury, and so on. Um, on one leg of that journey, we went to the Prairie in Fontainebleau. Uh, where, you know, uh, Gurdjieff had had his Institute for the Harmonious Development of Man. And then on a separate part of it, I made a pilgrimage down to Cornwall in the far west of England, uh, where Wilson lived, and uh, spent an evening with him there and um, talked with him about his ideas, uh, his ideas about consciousness. And, uh, and the, the, he, he firmly believed that, uh, he agreed with Gurdjieff that we were, we were asleep. Uh, he thought Gurdjieff emphasized the difficulty of waking uh, up a bit too much, and that he thought that Gurdjieff, while he was very, very aware of what was wrong with human beings, he didn't have as much insight into the possibilities. But you know, this is something one, one could debate, and, and and so on and so on. Uh, but that was Wilson's take on it. And um, after that, I you know kept up a correspondence with him. And then uh, at one point, when I was um, working at um, a bookshop in Los Angeles, the Bodhi Tree. Which doesn't exist anymore, but back in the day, it was you know the most famous metaphysical bookshop west of the Rockies. Um, Wilson had come to Los Angeles uh, to give a series of talks, and I was house sitting for one of the owners of the Bodhi Tree, who had this fantastic place in the in the uh, Laurel Canyon in the Hollywood Hills. I called the Zen Castle, and um, I invited Wilson to stay, you know, uh, while I was house sitting. So um, he, he stayed there and we talked a lot and I visited him down in Cornwall. So, you know, I mean, I, I didn't have a particularly unique relationship with him. He, he, he was very open, very generous. And he, he, he met um, any, anyone who actually was interested in his work. And so, but uh, over the years I wrote about his work and we kept in touch. I reviewed books of his when I moved here to, to London. And whenever he came up to London from Cornwall, we would meet. He died in 2013, and then I, I wrote a book about him um, called uh, Beyond the Robot, uh, Life and Work of Colin Wilson. And the notion of the robot is his version of uh, Gurdjieff's mechanicalness. We, we have this uh, labor-saving device uh, inside us that we've developed uh, evolutionarily. It's an adaptation that allows us to... Uh, basically learn. So when you learn, say, how to ride a bike or how to type or play a musical instrument, at first it's excruciatingly laborious, you know, every little movement you have to have to apply your consciousness to. But then one day, suddenly, oh, you can ride the bike or you can type or you can play the musical instrument. And what's happened is that you've passed everything over to the robot who does it for you. And then that frees you up to decide where you want to go on the bike or what you want to play on the guitar or, you know, what you want to type. Um, but sadly, uh, it does its job too well. Um, the robot takes over uh, operations that we would rather do ourselves. So when you listen to a piece of music that used to thrill you and it eh, doesn't do anything anymore, you're not listening to it anymore. The robot is. So when you see a sunset that you know is beautiful, but you don't have any real uh, reaction to it, the robot is seeing it, not you. And um, Wilson discovered... Um, one thing, uh, or quite a few things, but when he talks about the indifference threshold and he, he discovered that when we're really sunk into this kind of, you know, robotic um, state, pleasant things won't, won't, won't get us out of it. 
something pleasant won't do it. We will take it for granted. But if we're faced with an inconvenience or a crisis of some kind, and we overcome it, or the inconvenience withdraws, suddenly we realize, ah, we're, we're much more alive. And this Gurdjieff was a master at creating inconvenience. He created artificial crises that forced uh, his students to you know, push past their mechanicalness. And um, Wilson took not the same kind of approach, but he realized that crisis, and this was something that was um, uh, common to his outsiders. He tells the story of uh, uh, Graham Greene, uh, a novelist that he actually Wilson doesn't like because he finds his, his books too too depressing. But when when uh, Greene was uh, a teenager, he was so bored that he took to going out uh, to uh, uh, the common here, here in, in London with uh, a revolver that he had found in his brother's uh, cupboard. And he had been reading about, you know, Russian soldiers playing Russian roulette. And so he put actually one bullet in one chamber spun the, you know, the chambers went out to the common, put it to his head. And when he pulled the trigger and heard click on the empty chamber, Green, Green writes that suddenly, you know, everything had been transformed where before it had seemed to be, you know, utterly, he was so bored that he was, he, he was, you know, happy to take the chance of blowing his brains out. But somehow when he went like that, and I'm, I'm doing what Colin would have done in one of his talks, he, he, his mind went like this. It, is, it had focused, it had concentrated. And suddenly, you know, nothing had changed in the outer world. Something had changed in green. He was suddenly seeing what was, what's there all the time, the kind of meaning and significance that's there all the time, but which we, we are uh, unaware of because we, 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 you know, the robot is seeing it for us. And there were other, other contexts like that. The, 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 uh, existential philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre. He said that he never felt so free when he was in danger of being arrested by the Gestapo. Well, that seems counterintuitive, right? You would think, oh my God, I'm not free. But no, because somehow the crisis, the inconvenience, the necessity for him to stay basically awake and on his toes had, had risen him to a, 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 a more intense state of consciousness. And this was something that over the years I found in my own life to be the case somehow. So um, I'm not any more awake than anybody else, but I have noticed at times that this actually does, this does actually work. And again, go back to, back to just to go back to Gertrude. Gertrude said like, you know, the one surefire method of waking up is to, to be aware of our death you know, the reality of our death, which is an insight he shared with the existential philosopher Martin Heidegger, who said, you know, we suffer from forgetfulness of being, but if we can really grasp the notion of our finitude, that 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 forgetfulness would dissipate. Well, there are a lot of directions in which we could take this conversation, but I think I will switch it to yet another topic, which is the subject of another book that you've written, since this is being done under the auspices of the Theosophical Society, of which Madame Blavatsky was founder or a founder. Maybe you could talk about her contribution, where, what you think she did, and basically her, the response to her up to now has been very uh, formatory, as uh, Uspensky would say. Either she's a, a much maligned saint or she's a total fraud. And uh, I'd be interested in hearing your perspective on this and uh, how you integrate these two or if you integrate these two. Well, I mean, to tell you the truth, I, I started out um, not being too keen on, on Madame Bavatsky. And uh, I you know, sort of accepted that she was probably, you know, if not a fraud, a, a, a con artist to a certain degree and all that and so on. But um, when I um, decided to do a book about her um, and my editor at Penguin, Mitch Harvitz, who you know, you, you, you know as well, uh, I said, you know, there, there isn't, as you said, there's, there's the kind of hagiographies or there's the highly critical ones. And I thought, well, you know, is, is, you know, is there space in between for something in between? And um, an American historian who, who I, I've read quite a bit, Jacques Barzin, um, who died a few years ago, but I think he, he I think he lived, I think he was 104 or something like that, you know, remarkable age. But he, he talked about somehow um, the problem with writing about someone, uh, it's not that they're unknown, it's that they're too well known and they have a reputation that precedes them. And he says something like, you know, um, it's difficult to teach the educated. 
because pe- uh, people know in advance. Oh, I know, who, I know, I know. And but what, that's something that I discovered as I started to do the reading about uh, my book about Mad Blavatsky, the mother of modern spirituality. Is like, ooh, actually, all the sort of stuff that I had picked up second, third hand. Um, a lot of it w- wasn't true, apparently. Um, and she was much more interesting. I mean, one of the things that I realized, and I, I know I had repeated, and I say in the book that I, I had repeated earlier, was that she. Well, she was, you know, she was said to like chain smoke hashish or something like that. She smoked tobacco a lot. You know, uh, we know that she rolled her own cigarettes and that kind of thing. Um, and somewhere someone had said, oh, she smoked hashish and that's why she had these visions and all that. But actually, there's no evidence for it whatsoever. And I think Jocelyn Godwin points out that the sources for her, her smoking hashish was um, uh, a friend of hers in her early days who was doing, you know, a write-up about her and thought just to throw in as, as many exotic romantic things as possible. And then later on, it was a spiritualist uh, who was uh, attacking her um, because she herself had, you know, uh, become public enemy number one among the spiritualists, have, have, having, you know, been a spiritualist herself. And she was saying, well, actually, all the spirits that these people are getting in touch with, they're not, you know, uh, Aunt, Aunt Tessie or you know, whoever they say they are, they're these kind of hobos of the astral plane hanging out, and they're, they're happy to talk to anybody, and they'll tell you they'll tell you whatever you want to know. Uh, and so I forget the woman's name who attacked her, but this, she was, you know, said all, all these horrible things about personal things about her. Among was that oh, you know, she she smoked hashish and all that. But those are the only two sources, and as far as I can tell, no, she was she was teetotal. Um, didn't you know? Didn't take drugs. Uh, was celibate. And so many other things. And so I, I, I gradually, um, I enjoyed learning about her. I was doing the book. I mean, that, that's, one re- that's one reason I like doing these books is I, 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 I wind up learning about something along the way. I forget who said it, but someone in the past said the best way to learn about something is to write a book about it. Uh, and you, you actually learn, you know, uh, uh, what you're writing about. And um, I think she was actually a remarkable individual. She, I'm, I'm, I've always been, you know, um, baffled by the feminists have never sort of grabbed onto her uh, because she was doing things in the 19th century as a woman that, you know, a lot of men you know, weren't doing. It was, she was certainly flouting all the, all the conventions at the time. And I also think that, you know, whatever we make of her, her tales of being in Tibet and the Mahatmas and all that sort of thing. Um, and I talk about that in the book and, you know, there's different ways to understand that. She certainly recognized that um, in the late 19th century or, you know, well, I guess ISIS unveiled 1877. So towards, towards the late 19th century that um, the West had, had seemed to have reached this kind of um, complete negation of anything spiritual. You know, it was the rise of materialism, not in the consumer sense, but in the philosophical or scientific sense. And you can see that you can, you know, you can see that in, in um, say a poem like uh, Matthew Arnold's Dover beach, where he's talking about idiot armies fighting, you know, at, at night and all this kind of these notions of futility. And there's another, uh, there's a poem by Alfred Lloyd Tennyson called the Kraken. And it's this, it's, it's, it's a very short poem, but it, it, it evokes this notion of this huge kind of great powerful beast rising up, you know, from the depths of the ocean to the, surface and then just goes back down. So there's this kind of sense of futility. And this was the period where the heat death of, 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 uh, of the cosmos was, uh, you know, being uh, talked about, uh, the discovery of entropy, the notion that at some point, all the organized energy in the universe would, will flatten out and everything would be like a lukewarm cup of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> it's a kind of uniform blandness of, of nothing at all. And she was saying, well, no, this is it isn't the this isn't the case. And she provided an alternative narrative at a time when the major religions, you know, Christianity in the West was losing ground in, increasingly. And she also introduced, you know, Buddhism to anybody today who's into Tibetan Buddhism, I think has Man Blavatsky to thank, you know, eventually. Although I know there's a lot of you know criticism about her interpretation of it, but all, all the early, you know, uh, scholars who were introducing Buddhism and bringing it to the West, people like D.T. Suzuki, and Edward Kahn's and Christmas Humphreys, they were theosophists. And um, they came, you know, to Buddhism through their, their um, involvement with the Theosophical Society. So I, and, and, you know, she also had enormous influence on the cultural world in, you know, Kandinsky, Mondrian, Scriabin, um, L. Frank Baum, uh, 
Edison, Abner Doubleday, whether he invented baseball or not, you know, Civil War hero. Uh, it's this remarkable kind of uh, radiating influence out into the wider cultural world. I mean, you know, the whole, the, the, our, our multicultural, multi-faith sensibility has its roots in, you know, the Theosophical Society. Uh, you know, the, you know, uh, there's no religion higher than truth and all, all the religions can't contain some, some part of it and all that. And I think, it, what was it, 1893, when you had the first world's religious con uh, congress um chicago or not I'm, I'm, i probably get the dates a little off but you know and the names exactly but this is one of the first time where you have you know a, a catholic a protestant a jew a hindu whatever all on the same sort of platform and and talking about um uh, you know the similarities and again this is this this is a theme that goes back to I guess, I don't know how far, certainly the Renaissance, you know, where the Renaissance Hermeticists, um, um, people like uh, Ficino and uh, um, uh, others were trying to find a way in which they could, this notion of the Prisca Theologia, this of the perennial philosophy, you know, you know not, not only Christianity and, and, and um, you know, the other faiths, but, you know, uh, they all, and Plato and Platonic ideas, they all, embrace in some ways this kind of central truth. And um, I would say today in our, in our increasingly fractured uh, atomized time, you know, that, that notion that uh, at bottom, we all share something universal is, is, is needed more than, than, than ever. One major theme of your work is consciousness. And you've written a book called A Secret History of Consciousness. And there seem to be contradictions in the development of human consciousness. On the one hand, there is a belief that consciousness is somehow evolving in a much faster way than Darwin would ever have posited. And on the other hand, there's the sense that, you know, with all of the craziness going on, that's always been going on, consciousness doesn't seem to be evolving, human consciousness doesn't seem to be evolving at all. How do you approach these ideas? Well, I think that's a tough one. I actually wrote an article for uh, Quest magazine, yes, uh, which is, you know, comes out from the Theosophical side. And I think the title was something like, if consciousness is evolving, why aren't things getting better? Um, well, I mean, one of the people whose ideas I draw on uh, was the German-Swiss philosopher Gene Gebser, who many people don't know about. Uh, he wrote this remarkable book. I think he wrote it in the 40s and first came out called The Ever-Present Origin. And um, he talks about different structures of consciousness um, uh, throughout human history and consciousness at different times has had a different kind of character. And he there's the archaic and the mythic and the ma uh, archaic, magical, mythic, and then the mental rational, which we've been in, I think, going back as far as, say, 500 BC with this period known as the Axial Age. The German philosopher Karl Jaspers talks about this period where, you know, the, the, the Buddha, uh, Lao Tse, Confucius, uh, the Jewish patriarchs, Zoroaster, and, and, and other, you know, uh, very, very influential spiritual religious figures all kind of appeared at the same time. But in Greece, in the I I Ionia, something else happened, and this was the rise of what we call rational speculation. Um, the beginning of people not being satisfied with the mythic um, answers to the questions of, you know, why things are the way they are. They, don't, they didn't want to know why this God or that God did this. They looked at a rock and they said, what is that made of? Or, you know, what, what, what's the basic stuff uh, out of which everything, you know, emerges and all that. And this is the beginning of, you know, what we would call philosophy and then in later science. And Gebser is saying that that, that mindset uh, sort of reached its peak during the Renaissance and it's been uh, kind of overripe since then. And he, he died in the early seventies. Uh, but he, he said that he believed that we, we, what we are experiencing, what, you know, what he saw was happening and that subsequent generations were going to experience even more intensely than, than, than he did was the breakdown of this. Uh, when the, the kind of rational ordered more or less modern world uh, starts to sort of fall apart. Uh, and he believed this could be in preparation for a further structure that he called the integral, which be, would be one that recapitulated the early ones and sort of integrated all of them. But there's no guarantees and there's no picnic. Um, and another philosopher I draw on, um, the, the Anglo-American philosopher Alfred North Whitehead, 
In one of his books, he says, you know, the idea, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but the ideas that have changed society have, have wrecked the society in, in which they, they emerge. So you have these new ideas coming and you have, you have an old way of things, you know, being, and then new ideas come in. It's an advance, but they tend to disrupt everything around them. So um, I don't know. I mean, you know, I, 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 I agree with you. There are these contradictions. I mean, um, and I, I go, you know, I've had conversations and discussions with friends and, uh, and friends that have, you know, say that, that are more prone to Gurdjieff's notion that actually there isn't this kind of evolution at all. You know, we're just as mechanical and just as stupid as, as we've always been. And you know, all you got to do is turn on the television or go online somewhere and you can see plenty of evidence for that. So um, I don't know. Um, at the same time, though, other people I do read, there's Gebser, there's Owen Barfield, um, who who is... Uh, comes out of the anthroposophic, you know, world. Uh, he, he was a follower of Rudolf Steiner, but he was a brilliant thinker in his own right. And actually, I met him. Um, he's another one of these characters who lived a very long life. I think he, I think he died at ninety nine, and I, I met him. I think in ninety here. He, he was ninety nine. I met him here in England in ninety six and ninety seven, and interviewed him. Um, but he he believed that, and he believed in an evolution of consciousness. Steiner believed in an evolution of consciousness. So. But I, I, I somehow want to say, you know, maybe we're mixing things up. There could be consciousness could evolve, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to reflect in things being wonderful, you know, and changing uh, in, into some fantastic thing. One, you know, one, one would hope that's the case. I mean, I, I have something I say to myself and I keep I, I, I'm resisting putting it up on you know, Twitter or something where I say there's two kinds of people in the world. You know, there's ones who give a damn or whatever you want to fill in and the ones who don't and the ones who don't profit from the ones who do but one day the ones who do outnumber the ones who don't and then the millennium will have arrived so that's you know that's what i i'm you know my own my own hope is that might happen and i i tend to um i tend to borrow an idea from quantum physics which i don't talk about very much but this notion it's quantum entanglement you know you have these particles that you know to together at some point and then ooh, now they're like really far apart but they somehow still know what the other one is doing even though there's no causal connection between them or if you think about neurons in the brain there's neurons that are involved in the same sort of operations but they're not contiguous they fire simultaneously but it's not as if one's next to the other one and you know given the one next with the elbow but they somehow know when to fire in order to whatever it is you're doing and um, so i tend well I, I tend to think, well, maybe there might be something similar globally where there's people around the planet that are not necessarily in touch with each other, don't necessarily know each other, don't know what they're doing, but their individual actions may all be involved in something that has a cumulative effect. So I don't know. I mean, this, this is, you know, this, this, what can you say? I mean, um, and again, you know, you think about evolution in Darwinian terms, it doesn't necessarily mean everything was hunky-dory you know, for the animals involved. You know, maybe some animals evolved and they were better to eat the other animals. So there could be these changes going on, but they not, might not necessarily have the same kind of connotations that we tend to associate or give to the notion of evolution. Um, but ultimately, I, I think, you know, everything rests on the individual. I mean, you and I can be conscious. Society can't be conscious because society is an abstraction. You know, it's it's society is made up of the people, but it, it isn't an entity in itself that can in some way be or do anything like that. So our best bet is for each of us individually to try to be as conscious as we can. Very good. Thank you. Well, we're approaching the uh, end of our time, but I would like to ask one final question, which is you have explored an enormous number of ideas and figures in your work. And I'm wondering if you could say now, what is the cutting edge of your own interest? What are you most interested in pursuing further at present? Well, hmm, that's an interesting thing. Uh, I hope this doesn't sound narcissistic, but uh, my next idea uh, for a book is to do something autobiographical in the sense that, um, well, there's two, two, well, the people often ask me, you know, as you, you mentioned earlier, I mean, you, I started out as a musician in rock and roll, and now I'm doing all this other stuff. How did you go from that to there? And uh, I have a standard story, like I said, yeah, I, I started reading these books back then and all that, but I, I often wonder, well, actually, how did I? And wh what's that, you know, what's that about? Um, and involved in that also is the notion of sort of, um, this sounds clinical, but adult development. 
you know, Jung was someone who who talked about that quite a bit and how his notion of individuation, which would hit, be his version of waking up, you know, and I, I think it's actually quite a few um, similarities between Jung and Gurdjieff, both as individuals and then in, in the ideas. And actually the last book I did, and I'm waiting to get it back from the editors, was the biography of Morris Nichol, um, who started out as a Jungian. He was Jung's lieutenant a uh, hundred years ago. Um, in the 1920s here in England, and he wrote one of the first books in English about, about Jung's um, psychology called Dream Psychology, which I think came out in 1917 or something like that. And then he attended a lecture by Uspensky, and he changed his allegiance and became um, a follower of the Fourth Way, um, which is what you know the Gurdjieff work is, is often uh, called, uh, to, you know, to differentiate it from the way of the, the fakir, the yogi, and the monk. Um, and then he taught the, you know, the work in, from early 1930s until um, his death in the, the early 1950s. Um, and um, so I'm waiting for that to come back. And um, I, I, it, doing that book actually led me thinking about, okay, well, what about myself? <laughs> you know, so I, I, one of the things you write biographies and some part of you starts thinking, well, you know, that, that this person did that, that one did this, this and that. What did I do? <laughs> what, what, what's, what's, what's my narrative here? And I, I'm, you know, again, not to sound too egotistical, narcissistic, but in the sense of, I said, adult development, like, okay, um, you know, Jung said individuation really kicks in in the second half of life. You know, the, the first part of life is, you know, you're growing up and then you have to establish yourself in the world and all that sort of thing. And um, then, you know, in the forties and your fifties, with any luck, you've done that. And then you can start to think about, you know, what does it mean? And that kind of thing. And I'm, I'm in my mid sixties now and I'm wondering like, okay, what, what, what is, what, not only what does it all mean, which believe me, I don't have an answer to that. But this, that still bowls me over. I can't believe that we, we find ourselves in this world here and nobody's got a rough guide. Nobody really knows what's going on. I mean, this, uh, this Gevorfen height, you know, that Heidegger talks about being thrown into the world. I mean, I sort of feel like that. It is, I guess, maybe because I'm closer to the end than I am to the beginning. Um, but then, you know, th that's the whole thing. You know, uh, I guess the mainstream psychology thinks, well, once, once you've established yourself, once you've, you know, reproduced yourself and your children, that's it, you know, actually, and in terms of Darwinian evolution, there's, there's, you've done what you're here to do and there's no more need for you anymore. There isn't anything, but the spiritual life, you know, can, has the potential to become much more of the center of your life at that point. And so I'm, and uh, in terms of my own career, I mean, I, I had an early period when I was a musician and I, gave that up. And I didn't start writing um, until I was in my 40s, really. I mean, I I did some articles in the States before moving here, but I didn't start writing books until I moved here. And I did my first book at 43. So, I mean, there is the sense of like, you know, a, um, carrying on, you know, further development, you know, uh, past the period when um, the official account would have that that was it. So I'm, I want to explore that kind of thing. So um, and and the the creative life itself, you know, why why are why are some of us compelled to do this when, when other people are quite happy to you know just have the you know nice home and all that sort of stuff? And there's nothing wrong with that. And this is one of the questions that oh, like the article I I, I sent you and you're going to use about Abraham Maslow, who was someone else who talked about you know the, the American um, psychologist who um, one of the founders of humanistic and transpersonal psychology, and um, he believed that we all have this potential to self-actualize, which his sort of version of, of individuation. Um, but he, in his late in life, he started to wonder like, why is it that some don't? Why, why is it that some people don't? Um, and there seems to be a few who, who are compelled to, to, you know, go further than just being, you know, a good enough human, you know, they want to be something, something more than that. So, and again, I'm in saying that I'm not, I'm not taking on any, any kind of credit for being anything exceptional, but um, I'm just trying to understand what, what has it been in me that sort of compelled me to do this? I, I might find out it's, it's not necessarily a good thing, but I, 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 I'd like to look at that. Well, very good. And I think I'm going to bring it to a close here. I think we've just about gotten through our time and um, it's been fascinating and uh, I've enjoyed it enormously. Oh, well, my pleasure, Richard. It's been good catching up with you and uh, thanks for, you know, your time and asking these questions. I appreciate it.